Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another session. How are my students today? Good, okay. In today's lesson, we will be learning about ocean acidification. Have you heard the term ocean acidification before? Okay, well, today you will be learning a lot of information. We will also identify sources that release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and waterways. We will analyze the impact of ocean acidification on marine species and ecosystem. We will also design various experiments to show the impact of acid on substances and we will look at mitigation measures to reduce ocean acidification. Okay, what are some common examples of household items found in our kitchen and bathroom area? Adita? Okay, Clorox, very good. A, a common household item that you might use or your parent might use? Baking powder. Baking powder, very good, Evelyn. Alcohol. Alcohol, very good. Marcelina. What kind of acid? Liquid soap. Very good, Ashley. Liquid soap. And maybe we can get one more response. One more response. Irma? Muriatic acid. Muriatic acid. Very good, Irma. Okay, thank you very much, class. So some of the common household items that we have named so far, we have Clorox, vinegar. Can you read with me? Water, alcohol, liquid soap, milk, muriatic acid. No. how are these items used in our homes? We find many of them on a daily basis, but how are they used? Erwin? Most of them are used to either disinfect dirty clothes or okay. cooking. So most of them are used as disinfectants. Sorry, disinfectants. For as cleaning agents. Okay, and you are correct, Erwin. Most of these substances here are used as disinfectants and cleaning agents. Now, based on your experiences, what are some characteristics of acid, of an acid? We spoke about muriatic acid. What are some characteristics of acids? What do we know about acids? Let me put the word up here. Yes, Erwin? They can penetrate through some, some substances. They can penetrate through some substances, okay. Edwin? They have different um, levels of acidity or the strength. Yeah. Very good, Edwin. That's a very um, important point. They have different levels of concentration. Can you share with us what you know about acids? It smells sour. It smells mm -hmm. sour. Some of most acids smell sour. Very good, Adita. Let's see if we can get one more response from the class. Anna? Corrosive. Very good, Anna. The word corrosive. And almost all acid students, students are corrosive. What do we mean by the word corrosive? Alexander? Not sure. Erwin again? Um, corrosive means like it dissipates the substance. Very good, and I like that word that you use. Kind of use the word again for the others. Dissipates. Or it disintegrates. It breaks down the substance that it is interacting with. Corrosive, it breaks down substances. And these are only a few characteristics of of an acid, we are able to determine that acids penetrate through substances. Acids are sour, they are corrosive, meaning that they break down different substances. Now, well, Rolise, sorry. How did you feel as you chewed on that piece of lime? It tasted sour. It tasted sour, very good. Yadira, did you have that same reaction, that same feeling? Okay, is it a type of, is it a fruit that you would want to be eating on every day? 
Remember, we raise our hand if we would like, if we want to share. Yes, Stephen? Okay. It depends. What maybe what you're eating the lemon with. Adita, you would want to chew on a piece of lemon, or so you're a very strong girl. Thank you very much. Now kindly put down the piece of lemon. And lines have a pH balance now of either two to three. Now I introduced to you a term just now, pH balance. The pH balance of any substance students, everybody looking forward, the pH balance of a substance, Kyle, tells you whether acidic or alkaline a substance or a solution is. So pH balance has to do with the acidic measure or if it is alkaline. There is a pH scale from 0 through 14. It reflects that the solution or the substance is an alkaline slash base. The lower the number, the solution is acidic. Now, we are going to do some experiments at this time. Each of you were given a sheet of paper. Write in the science lab report. Take your paper out, please. It says number one. The first procedure we're going to do, number one. Besides putting your name and the date on the paper, it says give a brief statement of the problem or task and underline it. So our problem for today, we are going to determine whether a solution is a base or an acid. So the title will be, students, kindly put the title on the page for me. Title, everybody, will determine the acidity or alkaline level of solutions. We will be using litmus paper to test the different solutions. So the title determining the acidity or the alkaline level of the various solutions that you have in front of you there. What is the purpose? We said that the lemons have a pH of 2 to 3. So what do you think the purpose of this experiment is going to be? For example, on your table you have muriatic acid. And if you, when you put the litmus paper in here, what do you think we're trying to find out about this solution, this liquid? Elston? The, how much acidified it is. Please repeat, Elston. How acidified it is? Or well, alkaline. we want to find out if the solution, the liquid here, is an acid, if it's neutral, or if it is a base. Very good. Hypothesis, students. Have you heard the word before? Hypothesis, what does it mean? A smart guess. A smart guess. A smart guess, very good. Another student, Yadira? A prediction. A prediction, I like that term. Prediction. Let's pick up the muriatic acid and let's make a prediction on this one here. Is this going to be an acid or an alkaline? Acid. You're saying acid. it's going to be an acid. 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 So I'll just put the letter M for muriatic. We are saying it's going to be an acid. What about the milk? Milk on the desk there. Yes. A base. We have a container with seawater. What do you think this is going to be classified as? As a? Alkaline. Somebody is saying alkaline slash base. So the seawater. Base. The vinegar, acid. vinegar acid. Remember, we are predicting outcomes before we do this, the procedures. The alcohol, uh, alcohol, I'm hearing two extreme. One person saying acid, another student saying base. What is our prediction? Base, alcohol. Did I cover all the substances on the table? 
They, they, well, this one is for another experiment. So we have alcohol, the Clorox. Okay. What is our prediction for Clorox? Acid. acid. Kyle is saying he believes it is an acid. Now, to determine whether these solutions are acidic or basic, where we will be using litmus paper. It's a special kind of strip. And when we put the litmus paper in the solutions, I encourage you to observe exactly what is going to take place. The procedures, I want each group to have a head leader. Kyle is going to be the head leader here, Kyle. So I kind of ask you to put on the glove on your right, the, um, the, your hand there. Then Adita in the corner, Edwin behind there. I am not seeing your name tag. Irma in the middle group, and Ro 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 let's see, in Roli, sorry. Okay, yeah. Okay, you can be the leader behind there as well. Kind of pass this to Kyle for me. We have different types of litmus paper, different colors. We have red and blue. For the procedure on your lab report, the first thing we're going to do, everybody is ready now? The leaders, are you ready? As the other group members are going to observe the first procedure, take one strip of litmus paper and put it gently in the Clorox. Dip it in the Clorox. Did you get your litmus paper here? Sorry about that. Okay. Take one strip of your litmus paper and put it in the Clorox and observe what happens. One strip. Remember, acids are corrosives and we don't want anyone to be hurt. Take one strip of the litmus paper and dip it into the container holding the Clorox. And hold it for a little while. See, I'm being very careful. Observe any changes that are visible. Please record your changes if you saw anything change. Write it on your lab report paper there by the data. The data is what you're observing, sir. If you saw anything different, indicate it. Write it on the paper by the data section. The litmus strip was placed in the Clorox. These are the results. I have here on the data section, litmus strip was placed in the Clorox. The result is write what you saw okay take another strip of the litmus paper and place it in the muriatic acid observe what the change is if any for example this is what happened to the litmus paper that i am using record what you what you're observing As soon as you're finished recording, you put the muratic container on the table. Okay. Take another strip of litmus paper and place it inside the alcohol. Everybody has dipped their litmus paper into the alcohol solution. Take another strip of litmus paper, students, and place it inside and dip it inside the sea water. Okay, there is one more to do. Take another strip of the litmus paper and place inside the milk. Dip it inside the milk. This is how my the litmus paper I'm using looks like this after I have extracted it from the container. Now, based on the observation that you saw, indicate, determine whether the milk, the Clorox, the seawater, the vinegar, and the muriatic acid, determine which one of them are or is acidic or an alkaline. Let's look at the Clorox students. When you dip the litmus paper in the, the Clorox solution, were there any visible changes? Some people are saying no, some students are saying yes. Let me hear from Kyle 
and I'll put, well, we have Clorox here. What changes did you see? Kaya? The litmus paper got a light, light color. It, the litmus paper got a lighter color. Okay. Another student. Are you able to say if Clorox is a base or an acid? Are you able to say from this observe from these observation here? Are you able to say if the Clorox is a base or an acid? Yes. Kai, let me hear from you. What is your conclusion? It clearly states that acid can is corrosive. Yes, sir. Go ahead. And in when we took the litmus paper and dipped it in the Clorox, it Change the, it depletes the color of the litmus paper. It changed the, changed the color of the litmus paper a little. Okay. I had that same interpretation. And when I did my research, I found out that Clorox has a pH balance of 11, which makes it more an, going towards an alkaline level. Now, it depends because most people believe that Clorox is an acid. And it depends on the amount of concentration that we are using. But on the pH scale, the, the Clorox is measured and indicated to be an alkaline. Okay, students? Let's look at the one with the muratic acid. What happened? What occurred when you put the litmus paper in this container? Ashley? The litmus paper turned purple. The litmus paper turned purple instantly. There was a dramatic effect. What does that observation reveal to us? It's a dead acid. It's a? Dead acid. Dead acid. Well, the muriatic acid is an really? acidic substance. Very good. What about the seawater? When you put the litmus paper in the seawater, did you observe any changes in the seawater? Did the litmus paper remain the same color? Okay. Yes, it did. When I put one strip of litmus paper in the seawater solution, it basically remain the same. What is, go ahead, Edwin. You had a different effect, Edwin? You saw something I, differently? I got uh, a mild green to it. A mild green? Okay. To seawater. No, this is a strip and it remains the same. Did you get the same color strip as I did? Okay, now that's a very important point. The litmus paper will change color depending on the concentration of the chemical that you're using. That's a very important variable. And also there is a rule. Remember I said initially that you have red litmus paper and blue litmus paper. Red litmus paper turns blue in a base. And blue litmus paper turns red in an acid. So you will see different shades of red, different shades of blue. And maybe that is why Edwin is seeing a shade of blue which might look like green. Very good, Edwin. Now we have one more concentration to work with. Did we look at the vinegar? Were there any changes? What has happened to the litmus paper? Turn red. It turned red. So the vinegar, this solution can be identified as an acid. Baking powder, now we are going to use the baking powder for another experiment. Okay, Erwin, I know you are very enthusiastic about this lesson today. Now, so we have learned and we were able to determine that the different solutions we work with, some of them were classified as base slash alkaline and some are def definitely acids. Okay, and let's, before we go on to our other activity, let us just capitalize on what are the characteristics of acids. What did we say are the characteristics of an acid? Corrosive. I gave you the lime to taste. What did you tell me about the lemon? It tastes sour. And are we supposed to taste all acids? No. Some acids, most acids are very Dangerous. deadly. So we, some of them are even toxic if we were to smell them they will contribute to respiratory problems, okay? So we have to be very careful when we're interacting with acids. But we said that they're corrosive, they smell sour, they react with metals and they give off carbon dioxide gases. What else can acids do? 
One more. What else can acids do? They attract to electricity. They conduct or they transmit electricity. I have heard of experiments where students and teachers use the line to conduct electricity with batteries. Have you performed that experiment before? Okay, so you can try it, okay? Um, the lemons can conduct. They're good conductors of electricity. Okay, thank you, students. And we, we, so we spoke about acids, and what have we determined about bases? Here I have a liquid soap. Let me put some in your hand, Ashley, and then you rub your palms together. Ashley, Elston, come on, Elston. It's a liquid soap. Marcelina, rub your palms together. Come, Irma. Put your hands out, that hand there. A little liquid soap. Steven. Okay, you want to try it too? Okay. Come, Evelyn. Rub the liquid soap together. What, what is the result of rubbing your palms together with the liquid soap? Students? Let me do it as well. It feels slimy. Let me write those adjectives on the board. Somebody said it feels slippery. Slimy. Another student, come on. It feels wet. It is the reverse of acids. Cool, okay, very good, Steven. One more response. Somebody said foamy. Okay, very good. Now, all these adjectives here, or these words, are describing bases. We spoke about acids, and now we're just going to capitalize on bases. The soaps that you use on a daily basis are made from animal and vegetable oils. Did you know that, students? Yeah. And the animal, Elston, you knew about that? Yes. Share some more with me if you could. What? The oils, animal and vegetable oils. Um, there's the, like the oil that you get out of citrus, out of the orange. Yes, the, sir. The, um, the, the oil? The, yeah, the oil. People use it to clean house. They use it as yes. disinfectant. Very good. And there's also the um, avocado oil that girls use up on their face. Yes. So give them beauty, make them more appealing. Very good, Elson. You're very knowledgeable in this topic here. So bases, the base, sorry, they're used as detergent, as, for, as soaps. And they're, I said they're made from animal and vegetable oil. Most bases feel slippery, wet, some produce a lot of foam, okay? Now, we're going, we're going to be looking at this chart here, and this chart is the pH balance chart. If you look at the chart over the side, students going up, it says increasing acidity. So the lower the pH balance of any solution, the more acidic it is. If you notice, battery acid and lemon juice, they have a, high, a low pH value of one to two. Remember I spoke about the range being between 0 and 14? Look at where milk is. It's almost at 7, which is the neutral base. Water is in, is a, has a neutral, a pH balance of 7. When we look at the scale going down, it says increasing alkal alkalinity. Milk, we have baking soda, seawater, milk of magnesia, and ammonia. They have a high pH balance of 10, between 10 and 14. Okay. Ocean acidification. Now we were doing a lot of different experiments involving pH balance, and I did those, had you do those experiments for a very special reason, because we will be making a connection with ocean acidification. It says fossil fuels. Now, before I continue reading, have you heard the words fossil fuels before? Okay, let me hear from you. What are fossil fuels? Well, um, fossil fuels are um, animals that have died in the past, way, 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 way back, and then their body fossilized, and then we get oil and the things. So, fossil fuel are the fossil fuels are the rem remnants of dead, dead plants and animals. animals. And thank you, Elston. Remnants of dead plants and animals. 
that has been cemented over the years and have formed oil, fossil fuels on the ocean's floor. When we burn fossil fuels, they release carbon dioxide into the air. Carbon dioxide. It says fossil fuels there are natural substances made deep within the earth from the remains of ancient plants and animals. Over time, heat and pressure turn decomposing remains into fuels, which releases energy. We also have tiny creatures called plankton, like green algae, which floated about in the ocean. They ended up on the sea floor, all compact together and turned into oil and natural gas. Ocean acidification is a major concern around the world, students, for all marine species. The main cause of ocean acidification is the burning of fossil fuels. Ocean acidification is a major concern to scientists and all marine species. The main cause, burning of fossil fuels such as coal, petroleum, and natural gas. The burning of fossil fuel contributes to the release of carbon emission in the air. And ocean acidification is the term used to describe the changes in the ocean's chemistry. The pH balance will change due to carbon emission that is absorbed in the ocean. Natural sources of atmospheric carbon dioxide include volcano, outgassing, whenever the volcanoes erupt, they release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. You have the decay of organic materials. Remember I had told you in a previous lesson that all living things contain carbon. Carbon, carbon. We have and the respiration of living aerobic organisms. Plants produce oxygen for human survival and they give off carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also produced by various microorganisms from fermentation and cellular respiration. How green plants make their food through the process called photosynthesis. Now we're going to be looking at a video on ocean acidification, I ask you, I encourage you to listen carefully. There will be a lot of key information shared that we will have to make a connection to to understand what ocean acidification is all about. Billions of years, the ocean has created endless varieties of life. Life that enchants us, that sustains us. And despite our science, life that mystifies us still. The oceans are an incredible place full of the most amazing kinds of life. Life that you could never imagine really working. Things that if, if somebody just thought of them and showed them to you, you'd think, that's ridiculous. Nothing like that could ever live. But it does. In 35 years of diving, it's, it's quite a picture. I've spent my life on the bottom of the ocean with black sea bass. I've seen white sharks underwater. I've been in schools of bait that would be so big that they will dark out the sun. I can only hope that the ocean maintains that vitality. It's, it's, it's an incredible place of mystery and, and it's something that's beautiful beyond description. People rely on the oceans in so many ways. Some ways are obvious, like food, recreation, transportation. They clean our shores. 
They protect our coastlines from storms. The oceans regulate climate and provide the world with most of its oxygen. But we are now certain of one awesome fact. The ocean's power to create life is rivaled by our own power to destroy it. Scientists refer to ocean acidification as the other carbon problem. The first, of course, is global warming. People have heard about global warming for years, but it's only over the past five years that experts really understood that the carbon dioxide is causing a problem for the oceans as well. And what's worrisome is it hasn't even been on our radar. Carbon dioxide pollution is transforming the chemistry of the ocean, rapidly making the water more acidic. In decades, rising ocean acidity may challenge life on a scale that has not occurred for tens of millions of years. So we confront an urgent choice to move beyond fossil fuels or to risk turning the ocean into a sea of weeds. When we burn coal, oil, and gas, we introduce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But the atmosphere touches the ocean over 70% of Earth's surface. So this carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere, we are also putting into the ocean. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, exists naturally in our atmosphere. Plants need it to grow. Animals exhale it in every breath. But carbon dioxide is also a byproduct of burning fossil fuels. And in large amounts, it is a dangerous pollutant. Since the Industrial Revolution, the ocean has absorbed roughly one quarter of the carbon dioxide produced by burning fuels. Scientists once thought this beneficial. After all, that carbon dioxide would otherwise accelerate global warming. But what happens when so much carbon dioxide, 22 million tons of it each day, mixes with ocean water? In terms of chemistry, the answer is simple. It becomes an acid. Since the Industrial Revolution, the ocean acidity has increased by 30%. With mathematical models, scientists have demonstrated that if we continue to pollute as we are now, the ocean acidity will double by the end of the century compared to pre-industrial times. That is a big problem. Okay, students, we just looked at a brief documentary on ocean acidification, and a lot of information that are very important were shared. Now, based on the presentation, what are some key points mentioned in the documentary? What were you able to, I, what were you able to determine from the documentary in regards to ocean acidification? When it mixes, it, when it, when it, when it mixes, mixes with ocean water, the shell of a, of a creature will be will die. The shell of the creature will become brittle. You are correct, Stephen, but I'm going to emphasize more to your your response. So carbon dioxide mixes with ocean water, makes shells brittle. Another student, Rosalina. The ocean's acidity has risen 30%. The ocean has been observing over 30% of carbon dioxide emission. absorbing over 30 percent of the world's carbon emission this is a very important point that you brought up because the ocean is now becoming a carbon source it's giving up it's collecting more carbon emission from the atmosphere yes elson crustaceans very good 
Another what? Another person? What did you learn from the video? Spe um, marine species that that die on um, go down to the um, sea floor. Yes. Contribute to the carbon dioxide level. Um, in and the what did we say? Floor. What did, what words did we use to describe the plants and animals that have died over millions of years and have become cemented on the sea floor? Erwin. Fuel. Thank you very much. We refer to those animals and plants as fossil fuels. And we said before and also in the documentary that the burning of fossil fuels, it comes in the form of coal, petroleum, natural gas. When we burn those fossil fuels, it gives off carbon dioxide. Another person would like to share in it as it pertains to the video. Kyle? Okay. Marcelina? Did you learn anything from the video, Marcelina? Would you like to share any point with us? Okay. According to the video, dark carbon dioxide is the main contributing factor. What are the, what are the different um, systems that are releasing carbon emission into the air? We have deforestation. Remember when we did the lesson on global warming? We identified many causes that contribute to the emission of carbon dioxide. We have the mine rays, deforestation, use of vehicles. What are some other contributing factors? Things that would give off carbon dioxide in, in, in the environment. The burning of garbage, thank you very much. Decom decomposing matter, the garbage that we throw from our home, from our workplace, all those Substances that give off carbon dioxide release the carbon dioxide in the air. The carbon dioxide flow, I would say, falls into the ocean as an acid. The carbon dioxide goes up into the air. It falls into the ocean as an acid. When carbon dioxide is absorbed in the ocean water, now this is a very key point, students, that I want you to hear. When carbon dioxide falls into the acid and is absorbed by the ocean. What it creates is carbonic acid. The carbonic acid hitch themselves. These are molecules. They hitch themselves or they attach themselves to oxygen molecules being absorbed in the ocean as an acid. When it falls from the atmosphere, from the sky, it falls on an, as an acid. When the carbon dioxide and the oxygen molecules combine, they will form carbonic acid. And then this carbonic acid, what it does, it destroys the calcium carbonate, which is the primary material used by many of our marine species to make their shells, such as the crustaceans. We have the crabs, the jellyfish, the oysters, the clams. What are some other examples of marine species that makes their habitat, makes their home from the shells? Hmm? I'm not hearing you. If you want to share, can you raise your hand, Elson? Yeah, the conks. The conk, very good. Another student. Another marine species that make their home using shells. Kyle? Crabs. Crabs. Well, we said that one just a while ago, but thanks very much, Kyle. Edwin? Clam. Clams, very good. Now, all these marine species will be affected because the carbonic acid destroy the primary material, the calcium carbonate. What is another, the common name for calcium carbonate? Begins with letter L. Very good. Who said limestone? What the carbonic acid does is to destroy the calcium carbonate, and so these marine species will become extinct after a while because the ocean chemistry is beginning to change. Since the ocean, the ocean is absorbing 30% of carbon emission that is released into the atmosphere, then it has a serious impact on all our marine species. There is also another important point that I want to bring across to you. In the ocean, students, you have different zones. You have ocean zones. For example, the first zone is called the sunlit zone. What is that zone called? The sunlit zone. Okay. 
Now in the sunlit zone students, this is where you're going to find mm -hmm. algae, the photoplankton plants, and they need to be living in this sunlit zone so that they can have access to sunlight. I didn't hear you? Yes, like the coral polyps. Very good. So they need to live in the sunlit zone so that they can get energy from the sun to carry through the process called photosynthesis. You also have another zone called the twilight zone. And in the twilight zone, students, this area does not get a lot of sunshine. But you can find animals that are illuminescent, meaning that on one side of the animal it is dark and on the other side of the animal it is reflecting light. And then you have the dark zone. You also have the abyss. The ocean floor, the ocean goes down in depth. So when we are looking out at the ocean or at the sea, we might only be looking at the sunlit zone. And that is where most of the marine species live. But in the other zones, there are marine species. But some scientists are not able to research them as well because these areas are very, very deep in depth. And so we have the abyss. The abyss and also the trenches. In the trenches, animals that can withstand very, very cold temperatures. Okay, so this, this is the different zones for the ocean. How ocean acidification will affect these marine species? The animals in the marine species in the sunlit zone will get access to energy, but as the carbonic acid destroys the calcium carbonate, the animals in marine species Kyle, that live in these areas, they will not be able to get access to a lot of oxygen because the oxygen molecules will become dissolute. They will dissolve because of the acid. If the ocean chemistry changes, the animals that live in these zones here will become extinct very, very fast because the oxygen molecules will be destroyed. Therefore, these, the animals in these areas won't get oxygen to survive. Now, do you understand those points there? It has the oceans are made up of salt water on like rivers and streams, which are made up of fresh water. And salt water tastes salty. But it contains, it contains more than salt. It has in a variety of minerals from gold, from sodium to gold. Most animals, including humans, cannot drink salt water. If we were to drink salt water, what would be the effect on our human body if we were to consume salt water? Remember to raise your hand. If we were to drink salt water, if we are lost out there on the sea for days without fresh water, without water from our distilled bottles, what would be the effect on our bodies? You yes, start Edwin? drinking salt water, you start hallucinating on um, You start diarrhea, hallucination. Yeah, diarrhea and vomiting a lot. Diarrhea and vomiting. Come on. Very good so far, Edwin. Well, there is a term I want you to bring out. Begins with letter D. You get even more dehydrated than before you drank the seawater. Very good, Edwin. That is the term I want you to bring out. So we cannot be drinking salt water. It will cause, cause us de cause dehydration and we become very weak in our body. Our bodies will lose a lot of salts. Now, dissolved ocean decreases the available amount of calcium carbonate needed to make the shell and the exoskeleton of our marine species. Okay. Now we're going to do another experiment to see, to make a connection with carbon dioxide being absorbed by our oceans. On your table there, you have a container with water. You should have a spoon. I kind of take the spoon, the leader for the group. And if you want to appoint a new leader for this experiment, you can do so. We want equal participation. The, lead, the other person designated as the leader will take the spoon. You have a container with the baking powder. Somebody was asking about the use of the baking powder from the beginning of the lesson. Now this is the time we're going to use this baking powder. And we can also substitute the baking powder for the baking soda. You're going to take some of the sample of vinegar that you had in the container. The vinegar, you had a container with vinegar. 
pour the vinegar into the container with the water. Yes, you can pour all of the vinegar. After you have poured in the vinegar, take the spoon and dip one spoonful of the baking powder and pour it in the container. One spoonful, take from the container and put it inside the, the larger container with the water and the vinegar. Pour it inside the container and look for any changes. Observe the changes and then you record. Be careful, just be careful. After mixing the baking powder and the vinegar, what were you able to observe? Let me see by the raising of hands. Elson here. There were foam on the surface of the water. Foam was produced on the surface of the water. Foam was produced. Another student from another group. Foam was produced, that is correct. Edwin. You, you could see how the, the baking powder began to um, disperse uh, across the, um, the amount of water. This dispersed across the water? That is a very good observation. So the baking powder dispersed. Now this word here, disperse. The baking powder molecules, the baking powder substance scattered in the water. And he used a very important word called disperse. What does that tell us about the baking powder and the water with the vinegar added to it? The baking powder? Yes, it what spread it out. It spread it out. Um, we hear from Kyle. Did you see the same observation as Edwin and Erwin? Small, small air bubbles resting at the bottom. Small air bubbles were seen at the bottom of the container, air bubbles. Now the word disperse here. It told us that the baking powder dissolved in the water and the vinegar. It became a solution. It dissolved. The water is the solvent. Water is the universal solvent. And in this case, the baking powder is the solute. Very good. Okay, so that was what I wanted to get from you just now. As we mix the baking, the baking powder inside the water, which is the solvent. Okay. Now the baking soda contains sodium bicarbonate. It's a very big chemical name. And when we mix the baking soda with the vinegar and the water, carbon dioxide was given off into the air. We had the production, or we would say byproducts of salt, water, salt water, and the carbon emission. Also students, a chemical reaction occurred. What do I mean by a chemical reaction? We have physical changes when we're dealing with substances and we have chemical changes. What chemical change occurred just now when we mix all those substances together? Yes, Elson? Um, everything fused together, everything. All the, solu all the substances that we use were combined, but the carbon dioxide was given off. That was a new product made by the vinegar, the water, and the baking powder. Okay. Now we're going on to the, another part of the lesson. It says predict the effect of the solution on, on pieces of shell. You have a sh an egg on your um, table. Okay, I want you to break the egg slightly. Just tap it until the eggshells crack. That's our first step. The leader here. Break the, the shells of the egg. Come on, quickly. Okay. After you have done that, students, take off the shells from the egg itself. Take off the shells. Take off, you can take off most of the shells. And I, what I want you to do is to use one of your container that is empty and put the shells in that container. Put the shells in that container. Come on, break off the shells. Quickly break, don't be afraid to break off the shells, students. Imagine these shells being the shells and the exoskeleton of our crustaceans. Break them off quickly. 
Now you also have a container there with a little muratic acid. I want you to be very careful when we're dealing with this acid. Put on your glove on your hand, the person that will be putting the acid on the, the she, um, pieces of shells. And do not bring it too close to your face. Remember, these acids are very strong. And I'm going to put in one of these artificial shells that I bought to see if we will see any drastic changes as well. Put one of them in your container. Come on, quickly. Kyle, take it, take, kindly take two of the shells and pass the bag around, please. Thank you. Okay. Now, be careful. Once you have put all the pieces of shells together in the container, pour the acid slowly onto the shell. Keep it a little distance from your face and absorb the changes. Absorb the changes, please. Yes, sir. Put the acid, remember I said to pour it slowly and observe the changes. You can, all of them, put, it, put the acid on all of the shells in there. And Kyle, be careful, you should not be putting your finger in the container like that. Remember I said the leader because he has on the gloves. Okay, so this is your acid here. So, you, okay, let's wait for the other shells. Quickly, Steven. Put it right in there. Okay. No. Be careful there, Edwin. Open the door, miss. Okay. All right. Everybody is finished. Look at this one here. What are the byproducts of this experiment here? Putting the muratic acid on the shells. Carbon dioxide. We have carbon dioxide gas being given off. Another person from another group. Edwin. Uh, I suppose there would be some sulfur in it. Sulfur? Go ahead. Sulfur acid. Well, different gases are produced, but the main one is carbon dioxide, and we, we also have salts being produced. Sodium. Sodium bicarbonate. Very good. This is what happens to our marine species students. The more the ocean becomes acidic, and listen up to this point here, young lady. The ocean has a pH balance of around 7.2 to 8.4 unit. Now, the more the ocean becomes acidic, this is what will be happening to our marine species. Ocean acidification, our marine species will become extinct because they will be, they will, they will die out as a result of not being able to survive, not being able to make their shells. Okay, so we covered some very key points in today's lesson. We looked at different solutions to determine the pH balance. We looked at acids, base, or alkaline. We looked at what is ocean acidification, Adita. What are the causes of ocean acidification? And to review what are the causes, what are some of those causes that contribute to ocean acidification? What are some of the causes? that contribute to global warming. Burning of fossil fuels, and we really emphasize that in this lesson today. Kyle? Gas from motor vehicles. Gas, this, the, foam, the smoke that is given off by vehicles. Elson? Decay. Decay of organic and Unreal. organic materials. Kyle again? Burning of garbages. Burning of decaying material, combustion. All those different factors contribute to global warming and the carbon emission like i said before and repeatedly affects the calcium carbonate in the ocean which is the primary material used by the marine species to make their shells what can we do as citizens now what kind of mit mitigation measures can we put in place to reduce the level of carbon emission in the environment yes erwin we recycle whatever we are using Elston? Educate the people. Educate the public, educate the mass, our classmates. Adita? Enforce laws. Enforce laws, especially when it comes to cutting down of trees and making the, the tropical, the rainforest and tropical areas become more a carbon source than a carbon sink. Two more. What can we do as a mitigation measure? Oh, play signs play around sign. the environment. Yes, that will come under educating the mass. Public education. 
We can walk on some days rather than using our vehicles. Erwin? Take a bus instead of your own car. Very good. Use this energy. We have to learn to conserve. Okay. Thank Kyle. Use of solar panels. Use of solar panels. We're leaving the room. We take off our lights. If we're not using the computers, we take them off because they're burning energy. So those are some mitigation measures that we can adapt as citizens. Thank you very much.